Hello and welcome. I'm Tangle Delta. Welcome to Homo Ludens Ferns. And today I'll be joined by a, by a very special assistant. <clears throat> today I'll be joined by a, by a very special assistant. Caesar, sweetie, come out of the box, please. We, we rehearsed this stuff. Caesar, I have cookies. Wow. Ah, finally, you're here. So, uh, chat, say hello to Caesar. Caesar is a furry mushroom. More specifically, he's a furry agaricus. Caesar, say hello to chat. Wow. No, Caesar. <sighs> Seriously, we, we talked about this. First you do the thing, yeah, you do the thingy, and then you get the cookies. No, no, Caesar, you are not throwing a tantrum. Sweetie, you gave me your word. Sweetie, you promised. You promised me. Will you do the thingy? Ah, thank you, sweetie. Yeah, now you do the thingy. You you, you press the thingy. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you. So, the year is two thousand nineteen. Uh, sweetie, we can hear you. Thank you. So, as I was trying to say, <sighs> the year is 2019. And Johan Heisenha, a Dutch historian, a very prominent figure in Dutch academic life, decides to go on a very well-deserved vacation. For whatever odd reason, he chooses Birmingham in the UK near the end of May. He reaches the hotel, which happens to be the Metropole. He approaches the hotel and this is what he sees. And this is his reaction. So, Heisenha decides to approach the main reception desk. And he asks a very deep question. Who are those? He struggles for a moment. Animal people. And this is what he gets in response. Those, kind sir, are furries. So, he decides to go to his room where he manages to avoid having a mental breakdown or an existential crisis. He starts to contemplate. For he is the author of an incredibly important publication titled Homo Ludens, a study of the play element in culture. It was published in 1938 and had multiple re-editions approximately every decade or so. So, when he takes a look through the window and sees all of the 
bizarre, colorful fluffiness that's going on outside, his instinct kicks in. He decides to immediately take a shower, change his clothes and run down to the lobby and experience whatever this is. So we should ask ourselves a question. What can we learn from a book published so many decades ago? What can this tell us about our fluffy fandom, which exists since approximately the 1980s? Let's read. Play is older than culture. For culture, however, inadequately defined, always precipices human society, and the animals have not waited for man to teach them their playing. We can safely assert, even, that human civilization has added no essential feature to the general idea of play. Animals play just like men. So, let's talk play. Heisenhuth gives a bunch of examples of what he calls social play. And those are contests, races, performances, exhibitions, dancing. And he continues with music, pageants, masquerades and tournaments. But what are the characteristics of play? Here we have an example. Of a masquerade in progress. Very wholesome indeed. One of the first characteristics of play is that it's voluntary. First and foremost, then, all play is a voluntary activity. Play to order is no longer play. It could at best be but a forcible imitation of it. So, we can take a look at this situation from 2019's Confuzzled and just brush it off as a lol moment. Something funny is happening. One of the congoers approaches the concierge and asks her this question. Do they make you wear them? Referring obviously to the cute bunny ears. And we can think, yeah, it is. someone's doing this for the lols. It's, it's just a joke for, for, for a video. But we can look at it in a different way. Play is voluntary. So we can think of this situation not just as a furry congoer asking someone are, are they being told to wear the ears. We can look at the situation as in a player trying to identify that person as a player or as a non-player. This person is trying to sense the ground. Another property of play is that it pretty much exists for itself. It serves itself. Heisenhuth describes various theories, physiological and others, where various disciplines, they try to explain how does play work and why do we have it? Why does it exist in nature, etc.? And they try to use uh, physiological uh, interpretations or, for example, that little foxes play because they want to learn how to be big foxes, etc. But Heisenha decides to go in a completely different direction. Play is irrational and fun and it exists mo mostly for itself and that it's a special activity. So if play is a special activity and furry cons are playful, 
then we can draw this parallel that furry conventions are special activities. And this ties into, into the idea of an interlude. What Heisenheim mentions is that play happens in between something. For example, as a regularly recurring relaxation. But he also mentions that if play gets repeated often enough, it becomes integrated into normal life. And this is in fact what happened with furry cons. We have cons every year. And in fact, many people schedule their lives around those conventions. For example, they organize vacation time. They want to make sure that they can just go to a different city, to a different country, to a different continent maybe. So they have to plan in advance. And this is an example of how furry conventions as things that repeat, they become ingrained. And what, in my opinion, uh, the difference between a furry con and just playing, like for example, playing a video game and things like that, or playing a board game, is that while playing a board game usually takes a few hours, or playing a video game, a session also takes a few hours, furry cons, they last for days. And they, they basically are scaled up. That's the difference. So if you have a day or a week and you play for a few hours, if you play a video game for a few hours, that's a, that's a little chunk of a bigger chunk. But if you have a furry convention that's once a year, this chunk is proportional, it, be, it becomes much bigger as a result. So conventions, as we all know, they, they don't take place in just one day, it's a few days, usually over the weekend. And here we have an example uh, from 2019's Confuzzled. Someone mentioned PCD in chat. Very, very well. This, in my opinion, the fact that a furry con is practically this festival that takes three, four, five days even of your time, depending on when you arrive and when you leave. Uh, do you take part in the dead dog party and things like that? Or are you an early, uh, early arrival? It may take even five days or something like that. And because the high is so great, the downfall is even worse, which contributes to post-con depression. What should, also sh uh, what should also be mentioned is the phenomenon of repetitions and altera alterations. And Heisenha calls it like this. In nearly all the higher forms of play, the elements of repetition and alteration as in the refrain, are like the warp and the woof of a fabric. And we really don't have to look far to see an example. Here we see a table with Confuzzled and its themes. Wonderland, Carnival of the Night, most excellent adventure, let's play and 2019, the Brock from Badger, which was themed around spies and espionage. And in fact, I'm definitely not the only one who noticed that this is a thing. I recommend watching a great video from Culturally Eft titled, Why do furry cons need themes? Where they explore the idea of themes. They have a different approach, quite obviously, but they take note of a similar thing, that themes exist to refresh the entire experience. 
so that things don't become stale. So, we've went over a few things, that play is voluntary, that it's significant, that it's out of the ordinary. Maybe even we can add a bit of detail. Play is not ordinary or real life. It is rather a stepping out of, the, of real life into a temporary sphere of activity with a disposition of its own. And also we mentioned that play is an interlude between other things that can become a part of everyday life. So what comes next? Someone mentioned it in, in the chat as well. It's the idea of the magic circle. And this is one of Heisenhuss' most long-lasting uh, heritages and influences. Say hello to Badger headquarters, which is an example of a magic circle. Heisenhuss gives a bunch of examples. The arena, the card table, the magic circle, the temple, the stage, the screen, the tennis court, the court of justice, etc. are all in form and function playgrounds, i.e. forbidden spots, isolated, hedged round, hallowed, within which special rules obtain. All are temporary worlds within the ordinary world, dedicated to the performance of an act apart. And in fact, we see examples of it and we can also trace it in various uh, paper forms, I guess, and online. Here is a excerpt from the Code of Conduct of Confuzzle 2019. And it states very clearly that only registered attendees may enter the convention space, which will be clearly marked. So, when we are out there doing our lovely, fluffy, furry stuff, enjoying the art show, attending panels, watching contests, doing all sorts of things, we basically don't want the outsiders to invade. When when we enter all of those rooms, usually there's someone from security checking our badges. And now, once again, just like that example with, with the Congo or asking the concierge, do they make you wear them? We have to come back and take a similar approach here. Mm. We can understand this simple sentence in two ways. One, we can understand it that yes, Confuzzled is an event which has multiple attendees and security has to be upheld. We have to make sure that nothing dangerous or stupid happens. We have lots of random people. So we, as in the con organizers, we have to ensure that everything is in order, which is why we do things like this. We mark rooms, we check badges, we verify people, etc. But we can flip the coin and take a look in a different way. From the play perspective, all of this is happening because we want the players to be sort of corded in the same general area. We want them in the same space and we want them to be identifiable Hence, hence the lanyards uh, and even conventions, they color code lanyards so you can see who is who. First you're the handler, con ops, uh, security, medics and stuff like that. But they are all themed and we know that those are lanyards that belong to the convention. So this is uh, yet another way of separating. Okay, 
yet another thing that Heisenheim mentions, and I decided to highlight this in a special way. So please excuse the chunk of text that's incoming. It's about the community. Well, we, we f fluffy animal people are generally in a community. So I figured that it would be appropriate to highlight this section a bit more. A play community generally tends to become permanent even after the game is over. And this really strikes me when I think about furry cons. The feeling of being apart together in an exceptional situation, of sharing something important, of mutually withdrawing from the rest of the world and rejecting the usual norms, retains its magic beyond the duration of the individual game. And indeed, we once again don't have to look far. We had physical conventions, COVID said no. We made virtual conventions like this one or like the one last year. Here we can see a screen grab from the closing ceremony of Confuzzle 2020 with uh, the cookie boy himself, the, the, the cookie lord Brock. Uh, sweetie, mm, next slide, please. Caesar, Caesar, are you asleep? Press, press the, press the thing. Do the thingy. Are you serious? He ditched me. He just left. So now I have to do the thingy. I have to press the button. And I'm lazy. This is the reason why I had Caesar all along here. Because I'm lazy and I don't like to press buttons. <sighs> okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. I can, I can take one for the team. Okay, okay. So, what's, what's coming up next? Uh, oh, yeah. <clears throat> Order and rules. This is... This is yet again something really important, something that Heisenhut emphasizes pretty much over and over again in various places. Is that play requires some kind of order. And he even goes as far as to say that play creates order and it is order. Which leads me to this observation. It's about con rules. So, uh, by comparison with board games and video games, when you buy a board game, inside there's a book, a booklet, a pamphlet, whatever the size and contents that teaches you how to play the game. And it usually takes a few iterations for you and the rest of the players around to understand. Uh, what are the limitations, what moves are, what moves are legal, um, and how do the mechanics work, etc. Another example would be video games. Video games, they used to have tutorials, separate tutorials or instructions, but they evolved. And nowadays the preferred way of teaching players is through the built-in tutorial, the hidden tutorial, where the game keeps teaching you its mechanics, its rules, because mechanics are rules, basically, uh, all the way through. You learn one bit, you go further, you learn the other bit, you go further, etc, etc. And you just keep on learning until you have a grasp on the entire thing. The, excep the exception are games which belong to a genre that's very well defined, like the FPS game. If, if you know how to play Call of Duty, you know how to play the other Call of Duty. Or if you've played any FPS game in any capacity, you probably understand how to pick up the next FPS game from a completely different company. 
And this is where three cons, they diverge strongly. Because three cons feel a very special emphasis on teaching con goers how to attend the con the correct way. And here we have uh, an excerpt from Confuzzled 2019 from the schedule. My first furry con. A friendly intro to Confuzzled from two of our experienced staffers. They'll help explain how it all works and what you should do and not do to make sure you have a great time. So let's take a look at this. It emphasizes that the staffers are experienced. And it tells us two things, what you should do and not do. So it establishes what I've been talking about, that there are rules, either explicit or implicit. When you join a con, you are supposed to read the code of conduct and there's this little checkbox. Yeah, I've, I've read and, and I'm totally not lying. So that would be the explicit thing. But there are also implicit things that you should, you, you are expected to know them. And this panel, my first furry con, it's supposed to teach you in an explicit way the, the rules of play, basically. And it, and it promises that if you, that if you listen and if you uh, follow along, then you'll have a great time. So from the play perspective, we can read this as learn the rules with us so you can play with us and have fun. And because, because the furry fandom has a lot of specifics that may be counterintuitive, the existence of such a panel makes sense because there's a lot of to unpack. And indeed, Confuzzled definitely isn't alone here. Other furry cons do this as well. Nordic Foscon. So, this is your first furry con. Eurofurance, your first free convention. And in fact, there is a lot of to unpack. For example, the famous uh, how much can I see in fursuit exercise where suitors are asked to extend their arms and then start to move their arms right in front of them slowly uh, up until the point where they can actually see their hands. And it's a fascinating uh, comparison to see where, where do the hands stop exactly. Uh, some, some suitors, they barely see a thing. And this is a great starting point to discuss the spoil sport. We've just talked about rules. So who is the spoiled sport? We can describe this person by comparison with the cheat. Who is a cheat? This is someone who enters the play area, the magic circle, and starts to bend it in an unethical way. They start to do things, they start to break the rules, and they are doing this in such a way that they hope they won't get caught. So uh, with classic games like cards, like poker, the famous example is having an ace up your sleeve. You are creating an unfair advantage. Another example would be uh, installing illegitimate uh, add-ons or trainers. You're playing an FPS game and suddenly you possess perfect accuracy. You headshot every single player immediately. This is once again cheating, which is why it's frowned upon. But spoil sports are different people completely. They don't enter the magic circle and try to win in an un unethical way. 
they just nullify everything. They say, you're stupid, I'm not playing. This, this is stupid. No, no, I'm not doing this. No. They, they shatter the illusion. They, they make everything implode, basically. So this is going one step beyond. This is just taking all of the, all of the play, all of the fun, all of the rules, and then just shoving them through the window and saying that, nah, this isn't it. No, 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 no. So this is, in a way, looking down on the players. And Heisenhower mentions that uh, you, are, you are becoming a spoil sport uh, if, you just, if you just don't play, no matter what's the reason. For example, your parents told you not to jump on the trees or whatever, or not to roughhouse or something like that. Uh, so even if you're avoiding play because this is what you've been told by your parents or because you just don't feel like it, you get identified as a spoil sport and people don't like them. And it's time to start to assemble all of those bits and pieces into something more. Because furry has a lot of serious pretending. Here, the extraordinary nature of play reaches perfection. The disguised or masked individual plays another part, another being. He is another being. Heisenhower mentions a lot of times that play is not anti-serious. What he means by this is that the fact that we have play and that we are playing is in a quite paradox way, it's serious. We invest a lot of time and energy into playing. Mm. It's something important. And the free fandom has a bunch of examples, very prominent indeed. And probably the biggest one I could highlight today is the Headless Lounge. Once again, on Confuzzle's own website we see, don't remove your head in public unless you have to. The emphasis, the bold on don't, that's also on the website. That's not from me. There's an entire list of do's and don'ts. And this is one of those. Don't remove your head in public unless you have to. And this entire topic is... It's an evergreen topic. It just keeps cropping up from time to time. Here we see an example of a video about furry terminology where this topic is discussed among, among others. There's a bunch of words being discussed uh, in this video and the phrase breaking the magic is one of them with a, with a definition and an, an example. So we can understand that uh, the reason why this is such an important topic is because of all of the things that I've mentioned. Because fursuiting is very playful and destroying the magic, breaking the magic, would be an example of being a spoil sport. And just like I've mentioned, people don't like spoil sports because when a spoil sport does something, they don't wreck the play for just themselves, they wreck the play for everyone. It's a, it's a high impact situation. The actor on the stage is wholly absorbed in his playing, but is all the time conscious of the play. And this is basically uh, a more elegant way of saying this. Keeping up with, uh, with the illusion, making it work, requires effort. It requires uh, feeling the character. It requires you to be the character. So the last thing many suitors want to do is to just like the... just like that excerpt from the Confuzzled uh, side mentions, the last thing that they want to do is to just remove the head and ruin the magic. 
and this is why the Headless Lounge is under special protection. It's pretty much universally accepted that the Headless Lounge or the Fursuit Lounge is a place where you do not take pictures. And, all, and this goes very far. Uh, no one is allowed into the Fursuit Lounge with the exception of fursuiters, their handlers, and obviously con, uh, con organizers. Don't take photos in the lounges. It's rude and security will have words with you. So my understanding is this. If a furry convention is like a giant storm, then the Fursu Lounge is the iris of that storm. <laughs> this is where suitors are allowed to break the magic. This is where they are allowed to de-suit and, and do their thing. And this is why the lounge is so isolated, because we don't want everyone to see what's going on. We don't want to break the magic for everyone. So con organizers created this special space where it's safe and possible to do this. And all of this leads to a situation where fursuiters are first class citizens because of how suits are built, specifically the heads, but also tails and legs. Uh, fursuiters require that we non-suitors, we have to kind of dance around them because of the limited vision, mostly, but also other things. So they have dibs in elevators, hallways, staircases. In general, when just walking around, um, during, uh, during parties, uh, during dance parties, uh, and also there are those special gestures. For example, uh, you put your hands in front of you and you do this kind of swimming motion. This is to signify that you want everyone around you to just move, run away, because you want to go somewhere, probably to the Headless Lounge. And this leads me to my hypothesis. A fur con is structured so that it strongly supports fursuiting, because becoming your fursona, even if briefly, is the highest level of play. Which leads me here. The list of activities that I've read a few moments ago that was by Heisenhut called Social Play. It also has a different name. Heisenhut calls it High Level Play. And this is the same list, but a bit shorter. It has only six items on it. Contests, performances, dancing, music, masquerades, and tournaments. And there is an example of one thing in particular that happens during most furry cons that ticks all of those boxes. And I think you know what's coming up. The first suit dance competition. In my opinion, the first suit dance competition combines all of those things. As we can see here. Which would explain why first suit dance competitions are so popular. They combine they, they combine pretty much everything. It's like a high power cocktail. You have music, quite obviously. You have dancing, again, quite obviously. And competition, because it's a dance competition. So we have three things. We've barely started. And we have three things that Heisenhut considers social play. But on top of that, we also have performances. We have tournaments. Sometimes, if, if the structure of the event is different.
And also, because it's a furry con, we also have masquerades. And this is the special spin that furry has on the dance competition. So, my understanding is that a first dance competition is pretty much playfulness supercharged. It's this high power cocktail that I mentioned. And this explains why dance competitions are so popular not only within furry and within furry cons, but also outside of it. For example, when COVID came and it said no, one of the things that con goers and con organizers felt to, uh, to do was to move all of those activities as much as possible into the virtual space. And here we have an example of the virtual friends dance competition, which probably was the, at least the, the organizers think, was the very first virtual dance competition that was free. They mentioned that there were virtual dance competitions in general, but this was supposedly the first one that was furry. And a different example. Here we see the Entrocon dance competition, the virtual Entrocon edition. We see a bunch of audio video technicians and engineers sitting in some garage, I, uh, as far as I understand, somewhere in, in Washington with all of those just tons of cables, with this spaghetti of, uh, of cabling, of all of those screens, like command center style, doing their thing, but in the virtual space this time. And in fact, hopefully this is the last stretch. Hopefully we're reaching a point where classic physical conventions will will have their comeback and I look forward to meeting all of you there. Oh here you are, you little you little betrayer, you little monster. You ditched me bro! You totally left me. Caesar, you had one job, you had literally one job, just keep pressing the button and you just... <sighs> Wait a second, what is that? That's a cookie, isn't it? Where did you get the cookie? What do you mean by he wasn't eating it? Uh, was he wearing a hat by any chance? His nose, was it red? Cesar? You've committed Grand Theft Cookie. And you know what? You stole from Brock, the convention mascot. Seriously, we are so screwed, man. No, sweetie, sweetie. Why do you keep on doing stuff like this? Oh, I can practically feel Conop swarming in our direction. We are so screwed right now. They're gonna mangle the both of us. They're gonna mangle me twice because I'm your well, owner. Quotes. Oh, oh, this is not good. This is not good. Uh, mm. So yeah, uh, sweetie, 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 jump into the box. Jump to the box. We're leaving. We have to. We have to. <laughs> We have to ditch this room. We have to ditch this con. Preferably through the nearest window. 
No, sweetie, you messed up. We have to run. And leave the cookie. That's evidence now. No, sweet. Okay, so, <clears throat> so dear, dear chat, dear confuzzled, uh, it was fun being here. Uh, it was an honor and a huge pleasure. But uh, because of a certain incident that just happened, we have to uh, leave the con early, uh, probably fast. So, uh, please, please remember to tip the charity. They're doing good on this work. Uh, and those are my, uh, th this is how you can find me on the interwebs. Uh, unless you are from con security, then please ignore this last slide. In fact, please ignore all the slides. In fact, I was not here and Caesar was not here. In fact, Who's Caesar? In fact, uh, there's a uh, there was no presentation at all. If you're from ConOps, if you're not, then jump into my Discord. You'll find the link on my Twitter and my Twitch. Uh, we have food there, recipes and stuff. So yeah, you can also watch some speed paints of mine on YouTube and. Uh, yeah, f f thanks for having me and uh, Caesar. Caesar. Okay, go, 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 go while, while they're distracted.